Well, Smid mentioned that uh, this is a special morning, and for me personally, it's, uh, I'm just incredibly grateful for uh, Jerry being able to be here. Um, uh, this is, in, in some ways, some sort of um, installation service, and uh, that might be a new term. I've, I've heard people ask, what is an installation service? And, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, there's nothing necessarily uh, obligatory about something like this. What's obligatory is that we gather and we hear God's word. And Jerry's going to bring God's word to us, and so I'm thrilled about that. Um, there is something also that's, that I deeply appreciate about how the scripture describes um, pastoral ministry and training men and the furtherance of the gospel and the equipping of the church. And in the light of that, it's just uh, sweet for me and for my family and, and now for all of you here at GBC to be able to kind of uh, have a connection point with where I came from. Fifteen years ago, I, I started ministry at, at Grace Emanuel Bible Church. Jerry had been there for four years. Two years later, I was ordained. And so Jerry and the elders there uh, laid hands on me and said, we, we, we would affirm that God's called you to gospel ministry and that you should be doing this. And, um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a calling on my life. And so there's an element where, for me, I'm just a little bit jealous that this service would not be about me or about the Anderson family, but that it would be about church-based training and true ecclesiology and the Word of God. And that's what it is. And so, you know, to introduce Jerry, it would be, you know, typical at this point you insert a list of stats. And I'm not going to insert a list of stats. Um, although I will say that the stuff that's traditionally used for an intro introduction would all apply here. And so all of his books I thoroughly recommend and on and on and so forth. But for the purposes this morning, <laughs> what I want you to know is when it comes to being a pastor, your usefulness is your holiness. And 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul describes in a large house, and he pictures um, a mansion, if you will, as a com comparison to the visible church. And he says there's many vessels, and he describes unclean vessels and clean vessels. And he says, separate yourself from the unclean, and you will be useful to the master. And so as a pastor, just like any of us as Christians, your usefulness is is your holiness. And so I think the greatest way I can introduce Jerry is just to be able to say without any exaggeration, um, Jerry's mentorship, his friendship, his, 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 his preaching, his discipleship of me, the time that he's given to me personally uh, for my own growth as a Christian, as a, as a husband, as a dad, as a pastor, um, and my own growth in Christ likeness, prob probably second only to my own father. And I'm so grateful that he could be here. And so for me, it's just kind of a, a handoff in that sense. And I'm just thrilled that it can be a connection point for you to know kind of a little bit about where I came from. So, Jerry, would you come up and open up God's word for us this morning? Thank you so much for coming. John, good morning, Grace Bible Church. This is such a delight to be together uh, with Really, what has become a home church for me in so many ways, every time I'm out here, I, <clears throat> I'm just blessed to be with the leadership of the church and getting to know so many of you personally, and uh, we have so many connections, as John said, so it's a super privilege to be with you. It is true, installation services are, are not typically... Uh, a part of evangelical culture anymore, but it isn't really. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the traditions have been about it. It does provide opportunity for us in a significant way to mark the event. Whenever God sends out uh, a shepherd to minister in another part of his his sheepfold, it's a reminder to us uh, what God has done in giving us the body of Christ and what He's done in giving us shepherds after his own heart, and it reminds us to pray for the church and to pray for our faithfulness, and it's a reminder to us how important the body of Christ is in bringing us together weekly to hear God's word, and, and so installation service, whatever that may mean, it is a reminder to us that God has brought um, another pastor someone he's called and gifted to shepherd God's flock to a flock like this where you have like-minded leaders and a, and a body. And, uh, and we had the privilege of being with that shepherd whom we're sending to you. 
for a number of years, and uh, John and I um, have had really an uh, amazing partnership and camaraderie in the same things of the gospel. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Take your Bibles, if you would, and look with me at 1 Corinthians. We'll be looking at the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2. I asked a mentor some years ago what discourages him most in ministry as a pastor. And he said very quickly that it's how the circle of faithful comrades shrinks over the years. He had come out of seminary, he said, with a group of young partners in ministry, and they were like-minded, and they believed the same things, and they just went off into ministry uh, wanting to honor the Lord and, and carve uh, you know, a dent in the kingdom of darkness for the sake of the gospel. And, and so I said, well, what are the numbers? Like, what are we talking about? When you say your circle of comrades and partners has, sh- has become uh, smaller through the years, it's shrunk, what, what are we talking about? And he said, well, of the circle of guys I came out of seminary with, a, a handful he said, there might be one I've heard who's still in ministry somewhere in, and faithful in their Christian life. Like, one? And, and so what happens on the backside of that kind of reality is that when you, when you have brothers in this sacred brotherhood of pastors and shepherds that God has called to serve the church... Uh, though the circle might get smaller, the few that are together, like-minded, remains more and more precious. It gets more and more um, something to hang on to and to embrace and to hold. John Anderson is never going to let some service be about him, nor should it be. But when I get the opportunity to preach about the aim of a faithful shepherd, this passage comes to mind. It's It is why we resonate so much. It's why I resonate with the pastors of your church, Scott, Smed, the leaders, through the years. Because if you you look at perspective from the Lord on ministry, and you just sort of look through the scope, as it were, of, of His weapon to hit the target He wants to hit, there's a couple of crosshairs when you look through that scope, and they're very simple. But they are what bind us together in the sacred brotherhood of shepherding and pastoral ministry and, for that matter, the body of Christ and us as Christians. They bind us together, these two crosshairs that, if you focus on them, represent really the target of all ministry. And it shouldn't change from these things. And the challenges are coming and the culture in its evil is rising and and the swiftness with which people are just becoming lawless is rather breathtaking, has it not been? And so as that is happening, this precious sacred brotherhood of faithful shepherds who aim at the same thing, who see the same crosshairs, becomes very precious. John is very precious to me. Your church is precious to me because of its commitment to these same things. And you have the same aim and you're Leaders have the same aim, and so it's precious to me. Listen to the Apostle Paul when writing to the Corinthians. Your pastor, Smed, in the study this morning, just paved a runway here with his discussion about the sovereign work of God. Notice what Paul says to the Corinthians in verse 29. This will be the purpose of clause so that no man may boast before God. That's how God has worked. He chose the base things of the world and the despised things so that he may nullify everyone who brags and boasts about all these horizontal and human things. His purpose was so that no man could ever boast before God. But notice verse 30, 30, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus. By his doing, literally in the original, of him of his power, his doing, his sovereignty, his choosing, his work, his eternal purpose. That's how you got to be in Christ Jesus, who then became to us all of these things, wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, 
so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. This, that's right. Our boast is upward. Our boast is of the eternal one. Our boast is, the one, is of the one who brought us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And what did that result in? That, that's crosshair number one. The theological undergirding is that all of this takes place by what the Lord wants to do and what he alone can do. And what is the result? Well, that's the second crosshair. Paul immediately launches in chapter 2 into this statement. When I came to you, therefore, brethren, I did not come this way, but I came this way. I did not do these things, which is what you would have wanted, but I did these things, this thing alone. Why? Because I didn't want you to believe in something that, you would, that would destroy your life. I wanted you to believe in only one thing. And so I want to talk about the faithful shepherd's only aim here. And these two crosshairs of ministry. One is the theological underpinning and the other is the outworking of it. There's no other way to look at this. What is the faithful shepherd's only aim? His first crosshair is to boast only in God's power. Why did we end up with pragmatism for so long, so many decades? Why? Why did evangelicalism, you ever look at that? You ever look at how we got where we are? And why we suffered so much of a circus act? And so much powerlessness in evangelicalism for several decades. I watched it for four decades. How did we get there? Because we lost sight of what God was targeting. We did not look through his scope. We didn't see his crosshairs. We abandoned this first aim. To boast only in God's power. Paul says it just before he talks about his second Very practical crosshair, verse 30 of chapter 1, by his doing you are in Christ Jesus. It is a contrast with man's inability, which Smedley brought out so clearly in the early equipping hour, but look back at chapter 1, verse 21, he had said it, since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. That is a statement of absolute inability, as we heard earlier. Verse 26, consider your calling, brethren. There were not many wise according to the flesh, not many noble. That's right. You don't get there by pedigree or or some human achievement. You don't get there by by a trophy case or being an intellectual or some great career or grandparents that prayed for you and they were in Christ or you went to church all your life. You don't get there by any of those things. Nothing that someone else on a horizontal level may think of you you will get you there. Verse 27, but it is the foolish things that God has chosen, the weak things. What does that mean? Everything that the world would look at and say, that is utter foolishness, ridiculousness. Spiritual power, a man on a cross, a substitute for sin. Are you kidding? He was, maybe it was humanitarian. Maybe he thought he was dying for people, but what nonsense. But God has chosen that nonsense to the world to be the thing that saves. The only thing that saves by his power. For you grammar students, it's a genitive of origin here. Of him you are in Christ Jesus. We could say it this way. God is the sole ground and origin of all things and it is by him alone that we exist in Christ Jesus. That would be an expanded way of saying that. New creation in Christ. A postmodernist sort of person would profess Christ, but he'd have us believe that you reach out to the disenfranchised masses by allowing them to bring with them some of their horizontal baggage. No. Paul silences all such arrogance by noting that being in Christ Jesus is the only true source of all knowledge from God. Notice notice the relative clauses here. He is our revelation. He became to us wisdom from God. That's right. Your your mind was opened supernaturally. Have you ever thought about that? I was sitting there as Smedley was studying that issue and I was reading the scriptures and I read a little further in Ecclesiastes from his intro section 
And I was marveling while sitting there because he was hammering home the issue that it is God's power alone. And he said, it's God that illumines your mind. We have the mind of Christ. He was launching into 1 Corinthians 2. And I was reading Ecclesiastes and I was thinking, wow, I actually gravitate toward the scriptures that I'm reading. My mind is open to the truthfulness of it. I'm inclined to have it convict my heart. I'm no longer railing against it. That is a miracle. When you open the scriptures to study them or read them, you must understand that when you walk away inclined to the text you just read, that is a miracle. Impossible without the power of God. Christ becomes our revelation, wisdom from God by his power alone. We made that mistake. Pragmatists made that mistake. Years ago, the, the idea that you could, you could ask somebody, what do you want in a church? And the person tells you what they want, and they survey the masses, and then you go create that, as if that can open the mind to the truth. It's morally impossible. It is foolish. Christ has to become our wisdom from God, and the only way for that to happen is for God to open your mind to this great Savior this great revelation. Notice he's also our justification. He became to us our righteousness. That's that great way that Paul would later discuss it to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. This great covering righteousness by which we are declared acceptable. And he's our sanctification. It is of his power that we are transformed into Christ's likeness. And of course you don't want to think about justifying your own life by your good works. Or as John Anderson said a bit ago for communion, you don't want to imagine that you're earning God's love by obedience or losing it by your sin. You can't sin yourself out of Christ. God is not against you if he has justified you in Christ. But it's also true that that in this wonderful power of God, we are transformed into the likeness of Christ. I can actually choose to step in Christ's footsteps and follow him and imitate my Lord and Master. And he's empowered me to do so, so that I can actually love uh, like he loved and speak like he spoke. And and uh, be tender-hearted like he was tender-hearted, forgiving enemies like he forgave me when I was his enemy, and, and to sacrifice self for the sake of someone else. I, I could never do these things naturally, and now of him I am sanctified. I'm being changed. And notice, just going through this very quickly here. He is our glorification. He's our redemption. That's just speaking of the whole package. From start to finish, from being drawn, granted repentance and faith, from being declared righteous before God, then sanctified, both set apart positionally and set apart over time as you're more and more like Christ, and then ultimate glorification where Christ's prayers are answered when he prayed to the Father, I Father, want them to be with me where I am so they may see my glory. That's where we're headed. Of him that happened. Of him you will stare into the face of Christ perfectly holy, perfected in holiness, and never be judged. Of him you will arrive in glory with him and ultimately then look at him and see his glory and have it really pierce through our entire being so that God may be all in all. Of him, that happened. One of the things I love about my comrades is that you can hear it in their preaching. There's never this rhetorical attempt to manipulate people. There's never this sense in which they become the drama, but the drama is in the text. They don't become the power through rhetorical crafting. The text is the power. God's power to save. They're not surprised when somebody hears the truth in a worship service and stands up and walks out and, oh, oh, I'm I'm losing my voice in people. No, 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 that never happens. You know why? 
because the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. God sometimes breaks this person's heart over here and hardens that individual judiciously, just as Smed was saying earlier. What I love about my comrades and what I love about the one that we're sending to you, whom you already love, is that I've listened to him preach for 15 years, and there's never once in, in all of the expositions I've ever heard a sense in which he is on his heels trying to depend upon a human voice and a crafting of a human way to say it so that he could somehow accomplish what the Lord doesn't seem to be able to make happen. Never once. I love that. My heart resonates with that. You know... You know what is most amazing about that? That requires a man's coming under God's truth in his own heart. Look, we're just sinners. You know, he, he might look at my life and say, you know, he was a good mentor, but he and I both know we're just pathetic sinners. The only way that we can avoid the temptation to want to manipulate conversions is by coming under the Scriptures. If we didn't do that, we would surely become rhetorical and clever. Of him, you're in Christ Jesus. So crosshair number one is you boast only in God's power. And that has to come through in your preaching. That has to come through in your commitment to exposition. That has to come through in your not fearing when people respond by rejecting it or an entire culture starts to see us as the enemy of culture and they reject all that we're about outright and they don't let us live in the freedoms we've had. We're not fearful of that. God is doing his work. We might end up uh, completely isolated, put on an island somewhere, forced into seclusion, running into the hills to protect our children. Who knows? Who knows? We don't change anything about our theological underpinning. Of Him, we're in Christ Jesus. And do you know He's saving? He, 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 as, as culture gets darker, the light gets brighter, and there's more testimonies that are coming. I loved seeing the face of a, a couple that the faces of a couple that came back to our church after a job had taken them away for a while, and they recently came back. And I was reminded once again of the kindness of God because this gal grew up in Judaism, practicing Judaism. And her husband was a believer, but he'd had a tough time being married to an unbeliever, and someone that was practicing Judaism, and he, he got all marginal in his faith. But I was reminded that one Sunday while preaching the book of Romans, I was in chapter 2, verse 17, where Israel is being chided by God because they think they're going to get partiality when they get to glory because they were Jews and had the law. And basically, Paul says, you're just hypocrites because you preach that everybody shouldn't steal, but you steal. You preach that they shouldn't commit adultery, but you commit adultery. She came up to me after the service just sobbing and just said, I just came to Christ in that passage. <laughs> I mean, that's just the Lord. He's doing the work. And he's going to continue to do it. We should not fear because of him, Christians are in Christ Jesus. But then the second crosshair flows out of it and it's Exactly why when you look through the scope of this passage, you see the target that God is after. Not only is our faithful aim to be that we boast only in the power of God, but secondly, our aim is to proclaim only what he has said. Now watch how Paul does this. So because that's the case, then just as it is written, verse 31 of chapter 1, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord... And therefore, when I came to you, brethren, look what he says. I didn't come to you with superiority of speech or of sophistry, literally, the, the esoteric way of communicating of the day, wisdom, when I was proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Familiar words, verse 2, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I personally was with you 
in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in coercive or persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And and you look through God's scope in this text, and you see what the Apostle Paul has, by God's inspiration, written here, and you see the target in verse 5, so that your faith will not rest on the wisdom of men but on the power of God. That is why a a leadership, and therefore the church body, when you proclaim the gospel in your sphere of influence, that is why we only say what God has said. Man, we are prone to opinions, aren't we? We hang so much baggage on the clear message of truth. Why? We love to talk and opinionize. And once we got these in our hands, we could do it faster and more often. And we hit send all the time. And it's just going out into the ethernet. Opinion upon opinion upon opinion. Uh, One young man who was on the rise in the blogosphere was, he was writing on every subject you can imagine. I knew the man was in his early 20s. This young kid to me, so I wrote him privately, said, hey, he had weighed in on some issue (laughs) that I had been involved in at some length, though nameless, thankfully. It's good to be nameless on the internet. (laughs) I had some behind the scenes involvement, but uh, anonymity on the internet is a a wonderful thing. (laughs) But I wrote him privately, and I went through all of his statements, and I said, these are the facts. Okay, here's what you said. Well, these are the facts. Here's what you said. Well, these are the facts. And at the end, I said, you know, brother, probably not best for you to give the culture what it wants and weigh in and opinionize on things when you're completely unaware of all that that actually happened. I'll never forget, he wrote me back, hey, thank you, pastor. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know anything about it. I just thought I'd weigh in. That's what he said. That, that is the evangelical culture a lot of the time. I just thought I'd weigh in. Why? Because I can. Right, right. I, I get it. You can. You young people invented the technology, and so you can use it faster than lightning. I have a lot of grandkids that have faster thumbs than I. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> but maybe you didn't stop to think of whether you should weigh in. I'll never forget, my wife called me one day and she said, dear, this, this, this person that was of note said she was talking to her wife, to, to the man's wife, and, and um, the woman said, I'm writing a book. And she said, really, what are you writing a book about? Oh, how to raise teenagers. She said, y- your oldest is nine. She said, yeah, the publisher wants an objective viewpoint. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow, Okay. I had no idea. Neither do you. <laughs> Why is that important to say? Because the, the sacred brotherhood of faithful shepherds and faithful churches ought to be thinking about how Paul says it here. Notice, first of all, when he talks about proclaiming only what God has said, he took his human preeminence out of it human significance out of it. When I came to you, brethren, I didn't come with superiority of speech or of wisdom. But notice, first of all, he's just saying, I didn't come to you the way that the culture around you comes to you and the way that you stand for hours and listen to all these esoteric arguments from all these philosophers of the day. I didn't come to you like that. In fact, I wasn't about to flaunt the things that would feed you what you wanted. Notice, superiority of speech or of wisdom. Literally, I didn't come according to the lofty statements and clever speech techniques of the day. I brought none of them. These people were, it was a, 
It was a rhetoric culture. It was, you would stand spellbound by the sheer brilliant articulation of something. Today, we're all about digital this and pictures that and explosions over here. I get it. We, cultures shift and change as to what influences them. But in that day, much like it is today when, when people get online and they appreciate someone for the spectacle that they are and the drama is with the speaker, that was exactly where Paul's culture was at. And people would bring these lofty expressions that made the communicator seem far above the intelligence of the average person. And so everyone stood spellbound by that. And they would, they would entertain mysterious questions that suspended the logic of the crowd and made you think, wow, I, I've never thought of that. Oh my goodness, there's a whole other level I've never thought of. My life must be mundane. I've got to try to climb up to another level. Where, where the real meaning lies, that's what people were doing. And Paul came and he said, I'm not giving you any of that. I'm not only not going to give you that, I'm going to deliberately run as far away from that as I can. No brilliance of any of what you want from me uh, am I going to allow you to attach to me. The method is is not going to be a focus on me or my skills. The response of the audience is not going to be measured by me as if that somehow affirms me as a speaker. No, not not doing that. I'm going to avoid that all together. What am I going to focus on? Well, he doesn't dress up the gospel. Notice he says, because here's what I did determine by contrast, to know nothing among you Except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We sometimes focus on the last half of that statement. Except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And we, we launch into a message on the gospel, which is well and good. But actually the emphasis is on the crowd. I'm going to know nothing among you the way you want it, the way that you are expecting it, and the things that you would be prone to believe in. You would be prone to believe in things that are going to destroy your soul. These speakers give those things to you. I'm not giving that to you. I'm going to give you the thing that you might consider absolutely foolish. They say, well, did Paul sound like he was inarticulate? Oh, no. No, he had great communication skill. Acts 14, 12 indicates he was the chief speaker among those that would come in. And and the pagan god of, of, of communication, Hermes, he was confused with that among the pagans that wanted to elevate men. So Paul knew sound logic. He could argue things intensely and did in synagogues all the time. Reasoning with them, explaining, proving that Jesus was the Messiah. He was not inarticulate. He was not a lazy communicator. He was not a confusing preacher. He knew that clarity was the issue. Sometimes people will say, oh, these Bible exposition ministries are just too too definitive. Are you kidding? God is definitive. God is a precise being. He's eternally precise. And when he reveals, he expects it to be a revelation so that it's clear, perspicuous, perspicuity. It's clear to us. He's revealed it. Paul wasn't a confusing preacher. He used sound logic. He was careful about different cultural surroundings. He reasoned in the synagogues and preached on the hillsides of the pagan culture. He learned where he went about what it is that people were into, what their problems were, what the difficulties were. But being flexible about different cultures never caused Paul to equivocate from this crosshair. He never distorted the truth, blunted the truth, diluted the truth, confused the content of the truth. He never sacrificed clarity. Nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I love that. (laughs) Paul knew the power of the gospel. He knew what God could do and would do through it. And he even admitted to them his own lack of significance. Notice verse 3, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. We don't read those words about the Apostle Paul much. I mean, this is a guy whose, whose affliction sheet list from 
what he wrote to the Corinthians is the kind of stuff of legend. And yet here he says two things. First of all, I was frail and I was vulnerable. What did he mean by that? Well, I'm not coming to you as, you know, like you would, you would typically want a speaker that has the looks you want and the voice you want. Why? Because you want people to know, I follow this guy. Isn't he impressive? Therefore, I'm impressive. I am of Paul, I'm of Paulus. Don't you find Apollos impressive, mighty in the scriptures? Oh yeah, I follow him. I'm impressive because my leader, my guru is impressive. How did evangelicalism get to a celebrity culture? I'll tell you why. Because in here, we like how their fame splashes on our desire for significance. Paul said, when I came to you, Corinthians, everybody around there who speaks was not frail and weak. They're they're not vulnerable. They're powerful. Paul says, I was with you in weakness. I was with you in weakness. It could have been a physical malady he was talking about, Galatians 4.13, or it could have been some residual effects from the many times he was sick. He'd mentioned that in 1 Corinthians 11. Whatever weakness he's referring to, the whole point of this is don't focus on on me because the message is going to shine through someone you wouldn't ordinarily put up there. You wouldn't ordinarily really listen to. When's the last time you saw a conference advertised and you didn't know anybody listed, but but you were told by some close friends, that's a, that is a conference not to miss because those pastors are experienced, faithful, and they will preach the word. No. Nobody would show up to that conference and plunk down whatever it is they're charging. Not that all those things are unuseful. A lot of them are useful, but we, we wouldn't go to a conference typically of the frail and vulnerable speakers. Or notice what he says, and in fear. You're saying, Paul? Paul was afraid? Well, he wasn't afraid of men. He was in fear, literally timid and cautious, really, and in much trembling. He was dependent. What he's saying is, I didn't come with some personal, fleshly confidence that made me stand up there and just literally act like there was, there was no message to get clear. It was all really about what was on my mind to share. He didn't wander back and forth making it about how confident he was that he had the crowd eating out of his hand. No, he said, I came to you and, and I was narrowly focused on the clarity of truth and that's it. And I don't want to mess that up. That's what he meant by fear and trembling. I don't want to mess up the message that God gave me to speak. I don't want my weakness to result in a lack of clarity. I don't want to disgrace the gospel. I don't want to be a hindrance to the power of the message. I don't want you to believe in something that will destroy your soul. Notice verse For my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. I love that. Because now you know his precise target, his aim, is that the gospel should never be presented according to the popular dress of the day. Some of your friends who know you go to this church, they say, you know, yeah, I I just can't go there. It's just not... It's, it's, you know, too narrow. It's too definitive. It's, man, they're in your life. Everybody's in each other's life. I mean, that makes me uncomfortable. It's not, it's not really like, I mean, I go to this big mega church and it's fine. Everything's great. I can go in and go out. I hear the truth and I can leave. Paul says, look, I'm not going to do what's fashionable. I'm not going to do what puts man on display. I'm not going to do what elevates the trendy cultural devices of contemporary life. Whatever persuades hearers with manipulative device and technique, I am running away from it. Do you know why? Because listen, beloved, if someone believes a gospel which rests on any of those things, they've trusted a false power. And I don't mean that the power is just false. I mean they are trusting in the false power. They believe that's all they've needed, that they're promise is getting fulfilled, that their happiness is upon them when they're actually being duped. 
Paul knew the human heart. He knew that people's only hope was the straightforward diagnosis given by God regarding their heart. What is God's diagnosis? You're at enmity with a holy God who will judge the living and the dead. You must come and see your sin as your own. You must confess it before God and plead for his mercy. Paul knew that. He knew that they must entrust their eternity to Jesus Christ, his perfect righteousness and effectual sacrifice, or they're lost. He knew they must thank God for forgiving and saving them. And they must embark on a life of reading and learning and meditating upon the truth of Scripture, rejoice in obeying Christ, follow him, and die to self. He knew that. And so he said, I didn't, I didn't immerse my presentation with all those techniques, I came in the demonstration of the Spirit. I was looking for evidence of the Spirit when I preached. I love that. People say to me all the time, how do you know, how, how do you gain assurance? Well, just look for evidence of the Spirit of God. What does the Bible say is the evidence of the Spirit of God? Not just Galatians 5.22. That is clearly a packaged uh, dynamic there of the fruit of the Spirit. But everything the Bible says, just look for the evidence of the Spirit of God. Because if you're saved, it will be there. People say, well, I, I don't see much fruit in my life at all. So, well, okay. I understand that. I understand that. We have to grow, and Christians have sin, but, but let's just look at your life. When, when you tell me you're broken over how much sin there is, and that makes you doubt that you're saved, what I hear is that's the evidence of the Spirit of God. You're broken over your sin. Do you want Christ? Do you want his forgiveness? Do you want a, an intimate walk with him? Well, yeah, I do, but I can't have an intimate walk with him because I sin all the time. No, no, listen, beloved. That is precisely why you go to Christ and when you go to Christ. When you have a life full of that stuff. That's evidence of the Spirit of God in your life. Paul did not want a human result. He would only say what God says because as he says in verse 5 so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men but on the power of God to rest. I, it, it's the word from which we get the word stand. I want, it, I want it to stand on, be grounded in, have its footing in, be established in, firmly established on not the wisdom of men, which would be a false hope, but on God. You know, I was thinking about this wisdom of men issue and how pragmatism did it all backwards and the, the church has had to answer to the Lord for this, why evangelicalism is in such disarray and we're accepting all this garbage that's coming down the pike because all Satan did was let us percolate on our own methods and techniques for 40 years. And we weren't prepared, and we raised up a generation that wasn't prepared for Bible straight from God, saying what God says, and that's it. Instead, we gave a gospel that, that played to the crowd, and I was thinking about this. You know, if, if somebody in the crowd's intelligent or fancies themselves as intelligent, and you play to their intelligence, I mean, that, they're going to buy into a gospel that accepts the intelligent and, and acknowledges and even validates them where they believe themselves to be. Smart people are always vulnerable to lofty arguments and esoteric skeptical arguments that put human logic and genius on display. They're always susceptible to that. You know that. If you're an engineer, you know that you like everything in very systematic fashion, laid out in linear patterns of logic. That's how you're wired, not too abstract. So you would like a gospel that just laid out perfectly doctrinally systematic, all the things are nice and tight and neat. God's not going to let you have that. He is not going to puff up your intellect. Philosopher types, if you're a sort of a stand-up philosopher in the way you're wired, you're easily captivated by questions no one can answer. And so you're always peppering people with, you know, what about this question? What about this big question? And I took philosophy class, and do you realize philosophy class wouldn't exist if you had answers? <laughs> there is no philosophy class if you have answers. That's the point. But I know the philosophical type, deep theological conundrums that fry the brain. Look, if we couch the gospel in all the latest lofty philosophical language, in order to make the message acceptable to smart people, they would be attracted to it without dealing with their sin. You say, well, I'm neither of those, Pastor. I'm neither intellect nor philosophical. Yeah, what about emotional? 
What about you, you turn inward and you live on the strength of what is sensual in your life and how you feel? Sentimental people get easily caught up in the moving portrayal of human suffering and the drama of the human condition. And so preachers get up there and they just, man, they pluck every string on your heart emotionally. And you walk away and say, I met God today. Really? What about your sin? You didn't meet God today. You had an, an emotional experience. Music doesn't save you. Your favorite songs, even with good theology, are not equal to being close with God. Do you know what the highest form of worship is? Taking your heart and submitting it to the clarity of what God has revealed. Humble submission. That's the highest form of worship, whatever else we may do. Greedy people. Both rich and poor are always in danger of trusting riches on the one hand or lusting after them on the other. Man, the prosperity gospel has lived on that. What about just comfort? We all like comfort. Fearful people are easy prey to any message that offers a solution to whatever they fear most. You fear physical pain and the promise of healing in the gospel becomes a salvation message. You fear being alone or lonely and a gospel of friendship and family becomes your favorite gospel version. You fear conflict in relationships, so a message promising no more division, all unity, even if you don't know that it's dumbed down to the lowest common denominator, you will love it because it deals with what you fear most. You fear living in a world that's different than the culture we've had where poverty and Crime and disease and immorality and hopelessness are gone. Well, you're going to run after a gospel that guarantees a community where there's a level of peace and you will have rested on the wisdom of men. Paul says, I'm not doing that. I want your faith to rest on the power of God. That's the aim. And the two crosshairs that get you there, the first is God does the work. And secondly, we only say what he says. And we pray for the humility to come under it. This is our gospel. This is the the faithful shepherd's aim. This is why I resonate with your church and her leaders. This is why 15 years of ministry with John Anderson has been so precious. Bow with me. Lord, we've been through this passage so often. And it is just a reminder once again. It's like a... It's like an arrow that hits right where it needs to hit. It's it's a scouring pad that It clears away all the dross that hangs all over us, the the excess that we don't need. It is exactly what we need for our hearts. What kind of gospel are we trusting in? Is it a version of our own, giving us what we want? Or is it what you've said? Lord, do we humble ourselves under what you have said because you're the one who transforms. We can't manufacture conversions. We can't attract the culture by techniques and devices. We, we have only your truth and the promise of your power. Thank you for the Apostle Paul's commitment who who had the skill to manipulate people but never would. Even if he was called foolish and narrow. What a great testimony to us. If we end up in the culture fools for your sake, Lord, may we never depart from these aims. May we look through the scope of your revelation and see these crosshairs and Bring into focus the only target there is. Real faith. Genuine faith. 
that comes from your power alone, bringing life to dead souls and dead minds and dead arts through the faithful clarity of your truth. Help us see with discernment the, the areas where we leak as ministries. Bless Grace Bible Church in all of its labors right here in this place and beyond. Partner our ministries carefully and faithfully that we might hold each other accountable. Bless John's ministry and Ian April as they settle here with this sweet, precious flock. May the leaders walk together in unity around the truth, maturity in their growing Christian life. Protect them from the evil one. Protect this church as you have so faithfully done. And, and we will long for your name and your fame because of your power to be on display. And we ask it in your grace and for your glory alone. Amen.